So deceptive game design, what am I talking about? Why do I focus on games? It will all come in this presentation. Um, first of all, since many of you might not be experienced with games and the fact that we actually study games as an academic practice, I want to let you know that there's not a single thing that we call a game, right? Uh, there's many things that we call games. It's like a very fuzzy category, and it is studied as a field from a variety of disciplines, including psychology, philosophy, um, interaction design, you name it. So there's not only one thing that we call games. They can be understood like Andrea does in his practice as technologies that disclose extraordinary experiences. If you use gaming education, they can be used for storytelling, persuasion, or the conveyance of some notions. In case you're from an art background, perhaps you can see games as tools for personal expression. There are games like autobiographical games or games about personal experiences or visions of the future and so on and so forth. If you come from an industry background, perhaps you, better, you could better see them as entertainment products. Giacomo and I would see them as tools for thinking or playable thought experiments and so on and so forth. That's not important. I talk about it in my book. So the problem remains, what are games and what am I talking about today? and in which way it relates to what you're studying here. I'm going to start from a very, very sort of basic and let's say fundamental perspective, one in which I will treat games as any kinds of artifacts. And here we can find a connection with whatever you're going to be designing for your own exercises. So we're going to be treating games as something that is not appearing in nature, right? We, something that we have to make. And they're normally made with a function and with a purpose. The way we approach and use any artifacts, not only games, is always primed by the idea that somebody designed those kind of things and they made it with a purpose. Meaning that from our side, the players, the users, we come with certain expectations about what we're going to encounter, right? So when an artifact is something that in a way demands expectations from the users. I'm going to make an example. Uh, I've taken this picture in Norway uh, last spring. And as you can see, there's a boardwalk, right? That doesn't occur naturally, like any of us would recognize that as something that somebody made, right? And naturally we interpret it as being made with a purpose, such as having an easier time walking on rough terrain, for example, or not getting lost, right? Um, a book could be understood as an artifact, right? I pick up this object and I imagine that the words in it are in a way arranged to deliver a narrative of some kind. It's not a random assemblage of celluloid and ink, right? It's an object that was designed with a purpose. As a reader, I approach it with the expectation that I will be, I don't know, entertained, informed, instructed. Let me take you, let me take one extra step here. Even, let's say, fictional content, let's say that in this book, there is a description, description of a particular village and a particular kid in that village. Also, that one is an artifact, right? We understand it as being created by somebody with a certain purpose. If a certain thing is described with particular attention, we expect meaning from it and that it will be conducive to delivering the narrative. Am I making sense here? You might be more familiar with this notion when we talk about Chekhov's gun. Have you heard about this idea? So Anton Chekhov was a Russian playwright, short stories and theater pieces, and he was famous for, um, in a couple of his communication with other writers, to um, deliver this kind of idea. And I quote, one must never place a loaded, a loaded rifle on stage if it's not going to go off. It's wrong to make promises you don't intend to keep as an author, right? In another piece of writing, he writes, and I quote, if in the first act you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following, following act it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. What is, in a way, implicitly presenting is the idea that there's a silent agreement between the creator of something and the audience for that something, right? I make it so that you can use it and it should say what it does and so on and so forth. And it's not only true of pistols, this kind of silent agreement, or rather actual pistols, but in video games we have the same idea. Some of you might be players here, or gamers, or you like to qualify yourself as. So some of you might have played a first-person shooter kind of game, or a shooter kind of game. And you know what kind of big space a gun has in your viewport when you play these kind of games. The implicit promise there is that the difficulties you're going to encounter in the game and the problems you're going to be encountering in that adventure are likely going to be solved with that tool, right? I, it's here in front of your face all the time. Um, Another example, uh, you are walking down a dark corridor and you meet a 
this fully lit door in, for example, this is Bloodborne from, from software, of course. Uh, the door is locked. So as a player, you don't think like, this is randomly placed there, I'm never gonna be there. Why would they make a door or an interactive door to begin with, unless I need to find a way to open this door and continue my path, right? There's an implicit promise of gameplay in a locked door. Similarly, I find a key in a game. There's a chance that the designer also put a door somewhere that this key opens, otherwise why put it there? Like it's this kind of check, on, check of broken promise. I can continue with these examples, but I'm getting a bit bored and boring. Uh, take a fighting game uh, in case you encounter a lot of health items and weapons that normally promises what? Can you guess? Right, either a very hard area or you can encounter a boss soon. So this is kind of part of the literacy that you build through playing video games. You understand that as an expectation of something to happen. Great. So to sum up this introductory part, I'm going to treat in this presentation games as general artifacts. And understanding games as artifacts implies that the authors made the game and things within the game with a purpose and they, we have a bias towards meaning when we encounter them. Do you understand what I say when I, do what I mean when I say that we imbue meaning to the things that we encounter in video games, right? If we find a box in a real life on the, in the street, we don't think, ah, oh, that's for me. There must be a mystery, right? You know, like we imbue additional meaning because it's part of a game that was designed for me to be experienced in a certain way and so on. All right, let's go on. Am I going too fast? No. No, maybe not everybody is, uh, do you understand English? I suppose so, okay. So as players or as users of designed artifact, how do we get to develop this kind of knowledge and expectations towards the artifacts that we encounter? I'm using games as examples, but this is true for most artifacts, right? The first idea is ludically, that is with the encounter of the game artifact itself. I'm gonna make a couple of examples. This is a screenshot taken from uh, Mossmouth's um, Spelunky, which is a like platform adventure. And what you see here, maybe you can see also my, my pointer, is that the authors, the developers, put some informative panels within the game. This is the tutorial section, right? So that the authors say like, hey, look at you player, like why don't you jump over those chasms, right? Use these controls. Okay, that's a pretty confrontational direct instruction. Also, there's an implicit version of it, which is at the bottom of those chasms, you see like spikes that are not very friendly. Also, your character is humanoid, so you understand that falling on spikes would not be desirable. So there's a lot of communication already happening with the visuals of it that in a way is based on either what the game communicates or your lived experience. The interface also communicates and helps in understanding what's going on here. There's money an indication of how much money you have. So likely, I'm gonna have to accumulate and spend money in order to be successful, good. There is health or lives, so I might fail and die, and eventually I will be back to this world. And bombs and ropes also seem to be something that I'm gonna be using to traverse these caves, right? So I, I don't know very much about this game, but you could agree that that's what the game is screaming at me. Don't get killed, use this to jump, use bombs and ropes, collect money, don't lose health, right? Good. Dying is another good uh, implicit way of telling you what the game wants of you, what kind of subject you need to become, what kind of actions are going to be successful. The flip side is achievements, right? Instead of punishing you, you get like your little reward. Well done. This is how I want you to behave, player. Both of these were like the game speaking to you and telling what kind of subject I want you to be, what kind of expectations and knowledge I want you to have. That's not the only way in which we build knowledge about the artifacts that we encounter. The first was ludically, as in with the direct encounter with the object. And the second one would be meta-ludically. Somebody would say para-ludically. That means not with the direct encounter with the thing itself, but encountering material that surrounds the encounter with the thing itself. Think about, for example, trailers or posters or covers or reviews on a website. I'm gonna make you an example. This is famous 19, uh, 1978 shooter uh, Space Invaders. And at the time we didn't have a lot of time for 
cutscenes and presentation and information and dialogue, right? So not much is known about how to play the game. So the designers had to be quite inventive and use the surrounding surfaces of the cabinet to provide narrative information and instructions about how to play the game. So information about the game do not come only directly through playing the game, but maybe with material surrounding it. For example, also game manuals. You can read this before playing or during play, and that will, in a way, give you additional context, uh, uh, foreshadow certain things that are going to happen, and so on and so forth. So these are not, properly speaking, game world objects, but they still help us frame those expectations and biases. Interludic knowledge. So what happens if I encounter a game that is similar to another game I played, or in the same franchise, or made by the same author? It is possible that I can port some of my existing knowledge to this new experience. I've taken a screenshot randomly from Google, typing in first-person shooter. I don't know the title of this game, but even without knowing anything, I can already sort of deconstruct more or less what's going on here. There's a health keg, so I can be hurt. There's a gun, so I can shoot. There's a crosshair, so that's likely where I'm going to shoot if you can press my button. There is a timer, so this is a time challenge. I have a secondary gun, perhaps, to equip, and so on and so forth, right? I've never seen this game. I've never played this game. But due to having played something that is akin to it, to some degree, uh, I can deconstruct the experience and, in a way, shape my expectations accordingly. All right. And to conclude, I can develop expectation, biases, and knowledge about a game experience transludically, meaning from general game literacy. Our friend here in front already said, like, well, you find health and weapons, huh? so there's a boss fight coming. That's true for a variety of titles, right? Also, when we talked about health, for example, the fact that we use a heart or a red bar, they tend to be like recurrent ideas that are not typical of a genre, of an age, and so on and so forth. It became part of let's say, collective gaming knowledge. Are you with me still? All right. So second introduction to these ideas. And uh, this is how you gather knowledge from a game. Good. Should you need more information, there's a paper that's just about that called The Implied Designer and the Experience of Game Worlds. You by no means need to read it. But in case you have problems with these kind of ideas, as in generating knowledge about the game within the game, this could be a good idea. And guess what? You find it on the same website if you need it, and it's free and all good for you. Too fast? Good, good speed. All right. So we're slowly moving towards eventually talking about deceptive game design. I need one more step, and then we're there. Now, this is a design course in a sense that it combines at least a component of psychology and one, a practical one of design. And we have representatives of Politecnico di Milano here. And I suppose they will tell you that in general, when they say like design good stuff and meaningful stuff, they mean a very specific thing. They mean aligned to a certain paradigm, which is that of user-centered design. I don't know if you heard about this before. So, I was trained as an architect also at Politecnico di Milano like two decades ago. And the idea was that good design is design that understands the problem that it tries to solve and in a way caters to the audience that are, let's say, stakeholders within this situation that we're trying to address. It relies on the idea that the designers, let me repeat myself, should be well informed about the capabilities, preference, expectations, and needs of the intended users of the product and cater for them. This is normally considered to be like, do your design properly. I'm pretty sure that you're going to do exercises according to which you're given a situation and a target audience, and you need to study both. And eventually, your design will need to match the solution to the problem based on research, investigation, observation, and so on and so forth. Great. I mean, this is also the way I was trained in architecture. It's not like do whatever you want, call it a day. Your teachers will nod empathetically. And so there needs to be a way to measure good design, right? And normally, I mean, these people here in your classroom, not me, study these kind of things. There are alternatives, though, to user-centered design. Not everybody designs with this idea of let's make the world a better place and let's listen to our users. There are forms of transgressive design, transgressive in a sense that go against this commonly shared paradigm that user-centered design is great. Still in the context of games, I will make a couple of examples. 
The face you see here is Miguel Sicart, who together with Douglas Wilson wrote in 2010, Now It's Personal, on abusive game design. And they talk in their paper about a form of design of games in this case that is not necessarily this, um, pursued with the user's best interest in mind. They see design as a medium through which the author establishes a relationship with the audience, but that relationship doesn't need to be a serving relationship or a positive one. It can be ambiguous or abusive. So the designers can do things to have fun at the expense of the players or to put them in painful and embarrassing situations. Some of the games they designed were actually physically hurting the, the users. So they took it in a way as a way to like regain power or to pull pranks, right? Not necessarily good for the audience, but as long as somebody is having fun, they, it's good. And they, they provide a lot of examples about how they go about doing that. So they say, it's designed for me, the author, to have a kick out of what I do with you, the poor audience. You're almost like a victim in this case. Another case of transgressive design is discussed by Jose Zagal, who you see here, and others. Then when they talk about dark patterns in the design of games. You're probably familiar with dark patterns in a number of other fields, like interaction design and so on and so forth. That is, design approaches that in a way exploit weaknesses and cognitive biases to get an advantage over the players. For example, I can get you to play more or to spend more money on my um, app in case I put the buttons in a certain way or provide information that are ambiguous to a degree. Am I making sense here? So my design works perfectly for the function, but the function is not in favor of the user. Actually, it's in favor of me making as much money and having as many clicks and you spending as much time as possible with my application. Do you see what I mean here, right? So it's still per perfectly rational, only not in favor of the users. When I'm gonna talk today about deceptive game design, and it's not gonna be long, I promise, because my time is not infinite, I'm gonna talk about a form of transgressive design, similar to this, but instead of going against the interest of the players, it will favor the interest of the players. It might sound a bit confusing though, right? Like, how can I design in a way that is ambiguous and deceiving and yet have your best interest in mind? Let's get to see that. This is just saying what I just said. So the designer does lie to the player or present deliberately ambiguous information, but that's in their interest. I'm gonna show you a few examples so we are all on the same page. Has anybody played this game before? Really, no, nobody. A class of 40. Oh, well, I'm used to a different audience. Okay, so what you see here is a game called uh, Hellblade, uh, also called Senwa Sacrifice, that was released in 2017 by Ninja Theory. And the protagonist is a woman who also has a mental illness. So she hallucinates and has wrong world perception throughout the adventure. She is designed to, in a way, represent a particular kind of schizophrenia. Now imagine the tutorial section. And in the tutorial section, you need to try out a few things with the body of this character and the capability of fighting and whatever. At a certain point in the tutorial, the character is meant to lose, right? To die. So she's stacked against the character that she cannot win uh, against. So she dies, and after she dies, there's a cutscene in which the developers let, her know, let us know, and this is a screenshot from it, that the more she will die, the more the sickness that's inside her will grow. As a matter of fact, you can see like a rotting in her arm that will progressively grow, and the more you die towards the head, and they say that when this will reach the head, when this sickness will reach the head, when this rotting will reach the head, the game will be permanently over. So you will need to start again. She's properly dead. That dying is no longer like a small setback for the player, but rather something permanent. Um, the game does not, however, feature a permadeath mechanic. So this is only something that the designers project, like be very careful because you're gonna die forever and you're gonna start all over and lose a lot of time and so on and so forth. Um, the deceiving information was planted by the designers to add gravitas to the player's action, to feel that they matter more. Every time you die is going to be a blow to your heart. With the objective of increasing their emotional engagement with the game's outcomes and with one of the central narrative themes of the game, which is mental illness. So you also, as a player, will be acting on a false understanding of the world that surrounds you. So they said the emotion and the attachment to this game will be increased with this lie that we provide to you. 
Am I making sense here? So I'm treating you, patronizing you effectively, but I'm doing that so that you can feel closer to the game. This is one example. Here's another one. These are two screenshots taken from a game that a student of mine designed as part of a game jam. It's called Waldo.io. What you do in this game is that as soon as you join, you are requested to sign up to the internet. It doesn't work unless you're connected. You invent a player name for yourself and similar to other multiplayer online game, you're put into a lobby. The lobby gets populated and eventually you play essentially find Waldo with against other players, right? Find Waldo normally is a timeless game. You normally play on a newspaper and you need to find little Waldo, right? In this case, you have the added pressure of having to do it faster than five other players. Am I making sense? The idea though is that this is actually a single player game, right? The, the game does not have multiplayer, it doesn't have a multiplayer lobby. It asks you to be on the internet and pretends to do all these motions that I told you just to make you feel added pressure when playing a game that is actually not at all exciting in that sense. So the developers thought, what if I made Waldo competitive and in a way giving you some additional feelings other than the joy of discovery, uh, but yeah, without actually having those features, can I lie to you and obtain the same result? You see where this is going, right? Okay. These two examples that I proposed um, are examples of deceit that the player encounters in relation to the game world. So ludically, it happens while I experience the game. The game is, as part of its overall experience, communicating this lie to me. Good. We could also be lied to metaludically, mirroring the first part of the class. You remember when I said, like, how do you get information? Now, how do you cheat your players? Same thing. Metaludically, what does it mean? I can, in a way, lie to you or present ambiguous information in the material that surrounds the game. An example. This is the box cover of Metal Gear Solid 2. I don't know if you know this game or franchise. The franchise is super popular. It's one of the PlayStation's biggest franchises. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 1 came out on the PlayStation 1, and the main character were, was Solid Snake, which you see the big head of uh, on this box cover. Can you see him, right? So it was the best-selling game of the PlayStation 1, and everybody was expecting the second version. However, in the second version, you only start the first six minutes as Solid Snake. After that, you get to play a rookie, a new player with lesser skills that is treated as an imbecile by his superiors. And the fans, of course, were very, very angry about this decision because they were expecting more solid snake and instead they get a stupid rookie who talks funny and everybody think is shit. Sorry for my French. Okay, so when asked in an interview, um, this is uh, Kojima Hideo, um, when asking an interview like, why did you do it and aren't you afraid of fans backlash? He responded as follows, and I quote, not really, no. Um, in a sequel, you have to meet people's expectations, but also sort of go against them and deceive them, I think. What you see here is, again, an author thinking that he's doing the right thing for the fans, even if they're going to hate him at the beginning. There are a few other examples of, for example, deceit, deceitful advertisement about games. So you're going to have the time of your life, it's going to be action-packed, and then it's not, and so on and so forth. Although it's questionable whether that is in the interest of the players, and I don't think so. Uh, in the interview, Kojima was saying that this is absolutely the best for the series if this happens. Anyway, we can also cheat and deceive our players interludically. What that means is that not following the examples of similar games or games in the same group or games by the same author. Think about this. Um, you've, you have played fantasy role-playing games of some kinds in your life. I'm pretty sure you have. And you probably know that when you meet a chest in a game, that means reward, good stuff, new gear, something that makes me stronger and better, or money or something, right? Do you, have you seen chests in castles and remote locations and you go and open them full of expectation? Oh my God, this is incredible. Starting from the 90s, some Japanese developers starting to twist this on, his, on their head, meaning that chests would start to be tricky things, like enemies disguised as chests. In a game like Dark Souls, for example, many of the chests you encounter are among the most vicious enemies in the game, which adds expressively to the fact that the world of this game in particular is already obscure, dark, and uninviting, right? So having your expectation cheated in that way is part of that 
general communication style in which you shouldn't be here. This is dangerous, you're gonna die. Even the chests that you're supposed to get rewards from kill you, right? So do you understand how that plays into the expressivity of game decisions rather than being a joke, a lark, and so on? We could also talk about transludic uh, cheating, meaning cheating that comes from actually going against or tricking you with the knowledge that you gathered in general about games, but I think you already got the gist of it. And in case you want to read more about this, there's also a paper about that on the same website. You can download it, read it, it's all free, and so on. I want to focus on one last thing that might be useful for you and then give you a takeaway that you can use for many kinds of artifacts and not just games. So, in this paper, we propose a distinction between covered or cover, covered deceptions. So deceptions that have an experiential effect as long as you don't know, right? They have an effect on you as long as you, in a way, un, are unaware that the game is cheating you. This was one example, right? You might feel that attachment and the danger as long as you think that there is a permadeath condition, but there's not. If you knew that you could die as many times as you want, the effect of gravitas and danger would be taken away from you. So this is a hidden deception. It works as long as it remains hidden. You with me? There's one more, which is an overt deception, meaning that it has an experiential effect on you when it's revealed that you were cheating, the way you were cheated, sorry, by the game. Another example here. I'm gonna be very upset if nobody played this. Does anybody recognize this one? Giacomo, it doesn't count. Okay, you never played Undertale? Too bad for you. Anyway, <laughs> Undertale is a role-playing game in which you take the role of a character that, similar to other RPGs, explores a world and goes into fights and grows the levels and stats and become better. And you know the gist, at least like of general role-playing games. At a point about halfway through the game, the main character encounters another character that says like, yeah, I mean, I've seen what you've done and you will be judged for every EXP you earned. EXP in the language of video games normally, or XP is the experience you accumulated, right? The currency that you can use to improve your character. And so your character goes like, what's EXP? It's an acronym, it stands for execution point a way of quantifying the pain you have inflicted upon others. And it's about this point in the game that you realize that the game could be played entirely without violence and solving complex in other ways. But you have just played along with the genre conventions, right? Revealing the fact that you were about as a mass murderer as any of the monsters that you killed. So at that point, you were like shown the truth about the game, that the game was cheating you with wrong labels, like EXP is no longer experienced, LV, normally level is level of violence. So you would see that growing and you would be like, I'm doing great. But actually it's like the level, I mean, the measure of how murderous you were in the game. So again, you can decide to restart and play in a peaceful, not friendly manner, or you can continue and eventually be judged for what you've done. But you understand that the game is really making a point of using the ambiguity of those terms and you're being used to certain conventions to play a trick on you. Do you realize that in most games that you play, you're murdering things for your own interests? Right? Okay. Take a little breath, uh, brief, and uh, I will finish it off with a set of takeaways that hopefully you can apply to whatever exercise you want to apply them to, provided that you need it. So what is this good for and how can you use it? In literature and movies, these kind of deceptions are normally used to create false paths and false interpretations that tend to be pleasurable for some players or some readers or some audiences, especially if you think about, say, detective novels or mystery novels, where it is part of the play that the authors do to put you onto the wrong track so that the game, the game, the book or the book of the game surprise you and in a way reveals more content or more surprising content to you. So this is something that some users love to be in a way taken for a ride and then have the possibility to reassess their hypothesis about how the world works. In case you play Dark Souls or, again, like mystery novels, this is part of the pleasure of being proven wrong or reassess your judgments. Second thing, they can introduce some elements of surprise and confusion, confusions in the audience in case you think that's what the audience needs. And that happens to be the case, for example, in the latest game of Harman and Roiland, which is called High on Life. They were the developers of Rick and Morty. And their game is full of deceit from start to end. It tries to confuse you, put you on the wrong path, lie to you constantly, right? 
So they thought, hey, I'm almost done. No, no, fine. Okay, that's great. So the game designers thought it was part of the game experience and expressively what they wanted to do to keep you on your toes as in like, am I being told the truth? Is this real? Am I in a simulation? Why am I seeing these ads? Are the ads part of the game? And so on and so forth. Very interesting game. If you don't want to play it, you can check videos and it's almost like playing a cartoon of Rick and Morty. Okay, uh, and finally, so I said, what is it good for? Some players enjoy red herrings and false paths. Maybe as an author, I want to induce elements of surprising confusions and, and confusion. And finally, they give the possibility for the author to estrange the player and suggest a self-critical capability towards the object in the sense that similar to how in Undertale, you were in a way pushed back from your usual comfortable conventions and told like, hey, have you thought about how violent you are in games pursuing your own little goals, whatever they are. So in a way, it serves as a tool to put the players and the game at a distance, no longer engaged in that kind of almost incestuous and too close relationship in which the game wants to be believed and you want to believe in the game and you try to play as close as you can. No, it pushes you out, say, like, this is a artifact designed for you and, in, and we designed this moment of rupture so that you can look at your actions or your role as a player with a degree of distance. In game studies, this is called like, in a way, self-referential games or self-referential tools so that you take a distance and you see yourself as a player and you see your actions no longer as part of a fictional world, but in a different light. This is more or less what I tend to try to do with my simple games in which there's always or almost always a moment of sort of deceit and rupture and the game at a certain point asks you, point asks you questions about your game experience itself. So I find it as a very interesting critical tool to get the users in a way out of the comfort zone and in a critical state of mind, or at least a state of mind that invites a critical stance. So I cannot think of many better uses than this, but maybe you can. Uh, I've only written one paper on this idea. And so if you have better ideas or better examples, I'm listening to you. This is what I think you could do with your exercises in the deceptive line. You can enhance the content by making it into like a multi, uh, I mean, giving it the possibility to open itself to multiple interpretation. You can deliberately confuse and lead them astray, or you can put them in a critical condition by playing this kind of deceptive trick on them. I don't have much more, if, but if you want to read more in an academic sense, this paper offers a few more details, maybe some reference that you can also use to back up your decept deceptive, deceptive and confusing game design. I do not know how games are gonna feature as part of your course, but maybe they will also open the possibility for deceitful play. And that might be interesting, I don't know. I would like to see what happens in case you do. So I hope this was good enough for now. And again, uh, you can follow where I go next, which is Switzerland, uh, by following me on Twitter or writing me an email or you name it.